Every great religious tradition on the world has the concept of sacred space. There was nothing here, nothing, nothing. It was just rice fields. This temple will be the largest Hindu temple in the world. Science without religion is incomplete. Religion without science is incomplete. The two do go together. February 2012, Mayapur, West Bengal, India. Early in the morning, hundreds of local people arrive for their daily assignments at the largest construction site in the area. They are eager to give their best. Steady jobs are a rare commodity in this remote part of the Ganges Delta. But over the past four decades, people have been witnessing the transformation of a tiny dusty village and the surrounding rice fields into a spiritual capital attracting millions of people from a hundred different countries each year. So they proudly take part in the new $60 million project, which they are convinced, with its unique features, will put Mayapur on the world map. The story of the modern age rise of Mayapur begins with an old Hindu monk from Kolkata, who on the morning of Friday, August 13th, 1965, grabs his belongings, which are two sets of clothes and a trunk full of books, and boards the Jaladuta steamboat heading for America. Nothing can stop him, none of his family members, well-wishers, his aging body, not even the two heart attacks he suffers on the journey. He is on a mission. He has been asked by his spiritual master to teach the essence of ancient Indian wisdom in the Western world. His name is A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, a 69-year-old Krishna worshipper. In the United States, he is completely alone, vulnerable, and without any help. He is constantly praying, asking his Lord for guidance and direction. After a year of struggle, he meets youth on New York's Lower East Side who are hungry for mysticism and belief. I was wandering in the street, and some of the boys saw me, and gradually they came to me. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. He starts teaching them, caring for them, and helping them to find their way in life without drugs or self-destructive behavior. Readapting the ancient Hindu Vaishnava philosophy and culture to new circumstances, in 1966, in New York City, he establishes the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. In 1971, some of his young American and British disciples are anxious to accompany him back to his native Bengal. One of them is Jayapataka Swami, who over 40 years later, despite his current health challenges, is still one of the most influential leaders of the Mayapur project. I was personally involved by Srila Prabhupada in about 1971 or 72, and he sent me out here to uh, be the president here, our co-director, along with Ramananda. I was very excited because I had always wanted to go to India. But then I said to the devotees, I said, where, what, where is Mayapur? What is it? That's how ignorant I was. And someone said, I think that's where Lord Chaitanya was born. The young foreigners become immersed in the ancient Hindu Vaishnava mysticism. They learn from Prabhupada and from old books how Sri Chaitanya, who appeared in the 15th century, has been worshipped as an incarnation of Lord Krishna. Lord Chaitanya's birthplace, Mayapur, is considered to be a holy place. 
Chaitanya's biographies give a detailed account of the unusual greatness of his scholarship at a very young age, and later on, his life as a saint at whose feet religious leaders and even kings paid their respects. Also, Lord Chaitanya was the revolutionary leader of the first civil disobedience movement in India that stood up to the oppressive caste system. He was a great social reformer. Uh, India during his day was very segregated in terms of caste and separation of different classes of, of people. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu broke those barriers down and said that, that love of God is available for everyone. We still live in a world that's very much driven by social strife, ethnic strife, racial strife, nationalistic strife. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's message transcends that. Doesn't matter what your background is, and you're a spiritual being. You're a part and parcel of God. We're all brothers and sisters. And globally, we can really be united and, and learn to live together peacefully when we see that we have that shared connection. And that's a very important message for this day and age. Lord Chaitanya's message faithfully represented by Prabhupada resonates with these peace-loving youth of the late 1960s and 70s. Despite what turn out to be extreme physical and social hardships, they feel privileged to be able to assist Prabhupada in realizing his vision of this holy place. We got the land here, and gradually uh, we started to build up. There was nothing here, nothing. Nothing, it was just rice fields. There were no trees like there are trees all along the road. Nothing, there were no stores, there was nothing. It was just the road and rice fields, as far as you could see. In the beginning, there were a few devotees and just some cows and uh, bees. And we uh, learned how to live a natural life. I remember one night I woke up here in Mayapur, and I was, I was restless, and I went out into the fields, and I looked up at the sky. I said, what am I doing here? In the middle of a rice field in West Bengal, out in the middle of nowhere, with mosquitoes and rats and cobras, and well, I'm here because Prabhupada wants me to build a city. Ground uh, breaking ceremony for the new temple that was established by Srila Prabhupada in 1972. This was our first international festival at the birthplace of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Yeah, the hole was dug about 15 feet deep, and Srila Prabhupada went down. And he did some rituals there, and he installed the deity of Ananta Shesha. By the mid 1970s, the Krishna movement has spread all over the world. Within a few years, Prabhupada and his thousands of followers have established over a hundred temples and farm communities on six continents. Mayapur also is developing very rapidly. New buildings emerge, monks and families are moving here, and visitors are coming. Prabhupada thinks now the time has come to begin his most unique, magnificent, and visionary project, the temple of the Vedic planetarium. I was fortunate to be with Prabhupada here in Mayapur in 1976 and 1977. And that was a time when Prabhupada was really pushing the Mayapur project quite strongly. Vrindavan was finished, Bombay was already under construction, and building the big Temple of the Vedic Planetarium in Mayapur was the next priority project that Prabhupada had. So at that time he gave a lot of instructions uh, ideas and inspiration about what he envisioned for the big temple. He did leave a lot of the details up to his disciples to sort out, but the main thrust of what he wanted to present was very clearly expressed by him. After the passing of Prabhupada in 1977, his followers try their best to fulfill this great remaining desire of their master. Despite many attempts, however, plans to start building the new temple fail. The young foreigners are surrounded by suspicion, with obstacles created by the local authorities and some of the residents. Back in the 70s, they thought we were CIA agents. Getting permission to build and there's really strict land laws here about how much land you can own and all this kind of stuff. 
and uh, it proved really, really difficult. We had been totally shut down by the government, the previous government. They said, you cannot build anything. We're going to take away all your land. They threatened us. So many hurdles, so many problems. I thought, why are we struggling here so much, you know? So I was very frustrated, where, where next? Because we've been totally stopped here. Four decades later, finally, the circumstances have changed. The plans get approved. The temple of the Vedic Planetarium project is being skillfully managed by a team led by Alfred Brush Ford, the great-grandson of legendary automobile mogul Henry Ford. And the construction is moving ahead at full speed. I grew up in, a, obviously, a very wealthy family. I was a hippie at college, and people were looking for alternative uh, consciousness and I studied various religions. I studied Buddhism, I studied Taoism, Egyptian Book of the Dead, all these different uh, religions and spiritual paths. But none of it made very much sense to me. So that when I came across Srila Prabhupada's books, the Bhagavad Gita, and also George Harrison, the albums that he did with the devotees in London, I became attracted to the chanting of Hare Krishna. And I also had a friend who was a hippie with me and he became a devotee. So after I finished with college, I went to live in the mountains as a hermit because it was, the 60s were very tumultuous. So I wanted some peace and quiet. And he would come visit me and bring me books and beads and gradually got into the lifestyle of Krishna consciousness. And then I corresponded with Srila Prabhupada and we started a relationship like that. And in 1976, I was in Detroit when Prabhupada came to visit, and he was describing in detail about the Temple of the Vedic Planetarium and his plans for Mayapur. And uh, so he asked me at that point, he said, what do you think of this? And I said, oh, it sounds very nice. I had never been to Mayapur, never heard of it, actually. So I said, oh, it sounds very nice. And he said, oh, good, so you can help finance, you know. And so we had a big laugh because I just finished helping to build the temple in Detroit and had spent quite a bit of money. So I wasn't looking for anything else to do. It took many years to come up with the right plan, but I think that he knew that I, eventually that I would be able to deliver. I kind of tried to keep an eye on things and, you know, make sure that the money that I spend for the project, which Srila Prabhupada used to call my forefathers hard-earned money, so uh, I want to make sure that that's spent properly. Other professionals devoted to the project joined the team, bringing with them the highest technological know-how and state-of-the-art equipment. I was born in Macedonia. And at an early age, we migrated to Australia. So I continued my, my education there, and I became electrical engineer as a profession. And I worked on many skillful, very professional big jobs. I also helped to put together the first nuclear plant in Melbourne. In 1980, I came to Mayapur. That was my first visit. And I just fell in love with Mayapur. Basically, I am a mechanical engineering background is my education. But I joined in ISKCON. I was involved in the management in Bombay Jugo. I was a general manager and temple commander. We are working around the clock. That's like a, normally the working system, like a eight hour the working here is one day. But here one day we are getting for three days job. Like a morning hours, like one shift. Again, the evening of our one shift, we give overtime also. The Mayapur area is subject to regular floods by the Ganges River. So to resist the floods, earthquakes, or other natural calamities, the massive building rests on a so-called floating foundation, a special structure consisting of 2,500 pillars made of first-grade stainless steel. When the foundation is forced to move, the building adjusts with it, without suffering damage. The cement and other materials used in the construction are also of the highest quality to make sure the building serves its purposes for many centuries. Well, 
what you can see here now to my to my right this is called a batch implant this is where the cement is mixed perfectly actually it's computerized the, how much water goes in there how much stone chips how much sand goes in there and also depends on the temperature sometimes if the temperature is very high we even have to put ice in the water to make it perfect so that the balance of the construction becomes very even. Coming up this staircase, which is very wide, you're coming up here, then you're also coming up the stairs up here to the landing. This landing will be just a, an area that will take you all the way to the next level of stairs and from here you'll be entering the temple. This is where the temple room will be for Lord Nishinga Dave in a circular motion. And you can see here our workers are preparing to do the casting for the first floor of the museum area. standing on the third floor of the museum. Now we are actually getting preparations from this floor to go to another two levels of floors which will be the service floors for the big temple. This is the furthest point that you can view the deities of the temple room floor. We're standing near the center of the temple at the moment. The temple will be uh, made up of beautiful columns and deity rooms will be over here to your uh, left. And on my opposite side over here where will be Srila Prabhupada's Vyasa will sit there and Srila Prabhupada will look at the deities. The dome above the main hall of the temple will be over 100 meters high, or 330 feet, which will make the building the tallest Hindu temple in the world. One of the greatest challenges, however, is to create a perfect acoustic experience in such a massive space. These are the three exhibit levels, and above that there's essentially another two stories as well of windows, and only there does the dome actually start, the actual stainless steel dome. So right there, another uh, 12, 14 meters up, and then from there another 45 meters up, straight up into the air. So you can imagine how high and how huge this area is going to be of air that uh, we're going to deal with it as, as an acoustic space. Srila Prabhupada really liked the um, Capitol building in Washington. Inside and outside, he very much liked the architecture, which also, of course, mirrors many uh, wonderful structures like St. Paul's, St. Peter's. And many of these uh, structures, they have what's called a coffered ceiling, where the ceiling actually steps back uh, into it. So our dome is, is huge, a massive open structure. So we have to do some very serious treatment of that or we're going to have such a huge echo that no one will understand anything. What we've designed is, this is a, a coffered ceiling panel, but uh, this is just a mock-up in plywood, but there'll be 30% perfor perforations and it will be made from aluminium, which will be anodized, so it'll be golden color. And behind this will be about 20 centimeters of glass wool acoustic material. When you put 30% perforation in a very thin uh, material with acoustic material behind, the whole thing acts in the same way as just the acoustic material because it becomes like a, a resonator. If you look at this from a distance, it just looks like a nice pattern. You can't really notice the holes. But close up, you'll see there's many, many holes. And this will line the entire dome so that the reflections won't just go everywhere. It will actually just stop something like a recording studio, something like that. It'll stop those sounds. The temple of the Vedic planetarium will be unique in terms of exterior and interior design. 
The international team of accomplished artists are working out the fine details of the decorative elements of the doors, windows, walls, floors, and altars. The materials they use are carefully selected to make the panels remain sturdy, practical, and aesthetically pleasing for centuries to come. This temple will be also covered in white marble. Now, India has exhausted all its mines. There's no more white marble available. So I had to research overseas and we found some very wonderful marble in Europe, Asia, and also uh, in Vietnam. This is a white marble that comes from Vietnam. It's pure white with no flaws or greys on it. And also this piece of marble is another white marble that is from Turkey. And also on the dome, we're gonna be using a ceramic tile. This is a ceramic tile which is manufactured in India. This is a beautiful tile that will last for you know hundreds of years as well because it's specially prepared for us. The edifice will serve many different purposes. It will be a religious, educational and community center for the thousands of families and monks who had settled in Mayapur and contributed to the development of the spiritual city over the past four decades. Also for the millions of guests who visit here each year. When the new building opens in 2016, it will be able to accommodate over 10,000 visitors at one time. The most unique aspect of the Temple of the Vedic Planetarium, however, is the attempt to reconcile the two main aspects of the human search for truth, science and religion. Prabhupada understood very clearly that science without religion is incomplete. Religion without science is incomplete. The two do go together. Religious texts have a long history of scientific relevance. In the world of science, an idea or theory may have many different inspirations. A scientific idea could come from some religious text, it could come from a dream, it could come from a novel or a poem. The source of the idea isn't what's important. What's important is that a scientist is able to justify the idea in terms of observation, experiment, and scientific inference. If that can be done, it doesn't matter where the idea comes from. People often make a distinction between faith and knowledge that religion is the abode of faith and science is the abode of knowledge. But this distinction is very artificial. Both religion and science, each of them have faith and knowledge. The modern approach is that I have faith in my perception and if I can perceive something, then it's fact. Our approach is somewhat different. We have solid scientific knowledge that is based on the Vedic statements. And we have faith in those Vedic statements. And the two combined mean that we are in a position to be able to understand properly the scientific workings behind everything. But nowadays we have this mechanistic worldview that's being presented to us through the schools and colleges, through the newspapers, through the TV and all the other media. Uh, and they're presenting a rather dreary picture of the universe, that it's just some dull matter, and somehow or another it magically gives rise to life. When you look at the actual science that's being presented, much of it is just speculation. It's not based on any proven fact. Prabhupada's mission was to confront modern scientific atheistic theory, which is that life comes from matter. You know, that somehow or other there was a big bang and life evolved, Darwin's theory and all that. But from the Bhagavatam, we understand that that is just not true, that life comes from life. A 
There's a correlation between what we see with our eyes and what we will present in the planetary model. What we want to do is to open people up at least to the possibility of a different worldview than the mechanistic worldview which is currently prevalent and which is really being pushed very strongly uh, that this is the only way that you can see the universe. Uh, there are other ways and we want people to know what those other ways are and then we'll leave it to them to decide what they find to be more credible. The planetarium shows, films and exhibitions are based on the ancient Indian books of wisdom, the Vedas, as well as years of research conducted by an international group of well-known geologists, archaeologists, anthropologists and biologists. Their work has been supported by the 16,000 volume library of the Kolkata-based Bhaktivedanta Research Center. The um, Temple of the Vedic Planetarium, uh, the west wing of the building, uh, will comprise of about three levels of exhibits of various kinds. Those exhibits will be based uh, on these works. Uh, we have hundreds of exhibits, actually, that we can present, uh, all giving evidence uh, of a conscious-based universe. Uh, and um, on the top level, will be having a 23 meter tilted dome, which will be an actual planetarium. It will seat about 275 people at a time, and we'll be making various presentations, film presentations there. And that theater also can be used for conventions uh, and other works. In Mayapur, uh, we are currently receiving about four million visitors a year. That's before this new temple has been built. When the Temple of the Vedic Planetarium is completed uh, and opened, we expect that we will get probably about one crore of visitors a year. That's about 10 million visitors a year. Prabhupada's vision on Earth is about to be realized in all its glory. The opening of this temple is, is really going to be a historic event. Prabhupada wanted more than a temple. He actually wanted to change the consciousness of the world. We are aiming for a worldwide audience. Uh, we want to create something here which will capture the attention of the world, which will challenge people, uh, which will open their minds. <laughs> Krishna Tava Punya Habeva Krishna Tava Punya